Good morning. Good morning. All right, everybody here? All right, spring break hasn't started yet, so keep focused, kids. We want to welcome all of you to, I guess, but there's no clock, that means that we're supposed to be doing something. So we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, welcome to Perceptions. Welcome to uh, the First United Methodist Church. For those of you who might be visiting with us, we apologize. For those of you old heads, you just keep finding your way back, and we're grateful for that. Mr. Weber is in the uh, is in the uh, balcony like the old guys off the Muppets, and uh, he just needs a friend. But anyway, uh, if you'll please stand and join us. My God, there's an angel walking down the aisle. Am I seeing this, or is this really happening? Yes. Okay. Join us as we sing greater. It's really high and it's really fast. Kind of like college. But anyway, that's another story. So here we go.
set service in that time of year that you all probably get to see some of your friends at 10 o'clock. We thought it was 9 o'clock because it's an hour ahead. Okay, that was the only joke there is for service, so you all are on top of it. We want, not really, right? We want you to, uh, we want you to pay close attention to the announcements that are in your bulletin today. Uh, I'd like to point out a few things. And today, 4 o'clock, uh, the Angel Choir and Youth Music. I hope that you'll be there, Madam Angel. All right, maybe not. And at 5 o'clock, uh, we have Blast and the Youth Movie Night. So that should be good. Uh, you want to check Friendship Center for the Linton Love Banks and sign up for the uh, Disaster Response Training. And that does not mean walking into your teenager's bedroom, the disaster response training. But it could. Uh, we have... That's a joke. That's a joke. If you know me, it's pretty much all a joke. Um, we have Pray First at 6 p.m. on Wednesday in the chapel. And we do certainly want to extend our sympathies to the families of Martha Baxter, and Morris Decker, and uh, just keep them in your prayers. And then, of course, we have these wonderful, wonderful yellow sheets. And I would like David to show you how you should put this in your put the offering plate. <laughs> don't fold it, all right? <laughs> Whatever you do, don't fold it. So I know there are probably lots of other things going on, but those are the highlights. And we'd like to ask you to stand again, and we're going to now sing Glorious Day. And it is a glorious day. So hit it.
Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Sharon. One announcement that I forgot to mention is that the team of local outreach will be collecting donations for empty tombs, no late bills coming on the 10th, 17th, and 24th in Friendship Center. So certainly did not want to overlook that. Uh, I now would invite up no stranger to our congregation, Barbara Sacconi. Um, praise the Lord, she is no longer chair of staff parish relations committee, so she is not here to announce that anything has happened. And if she is, she's making it up, folks. <laughs>
scripture this morning comes from Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Our Gospel lesson is taken from the 18th chapter of Matthew, beginning with the 21st verse. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seized him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay his debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Let us be in prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are rock and our redeemer. Amen. Some may remember back in October of 2006, Charles Roberts walked into an Amish schoolhouse armed with three guns. There were 26 students in that schoolhouse. He allowed 15 boys, a pregnant female student, and three adult females with infant children to leave. He held the remaining 15 girls captive, tying their feet together. His rationale for his actions doing this was that he wanted to ex exact revenge for something that had happened to his daughter in his past. Notes that he left behind indicated anger toward himself and toward God for the death of his newborn daughter nine years earlier. Not long after the police arrived, Roberts started shooting, killing three of the children and himself. Two more children later died from their injuries. One could not imagine the death and the grief and the sorrow of the loved ones who lost their family members. I still remember 
just not comprehending what the Amish community did. They gathered together, including those that had lost loved ones in this tragedy, and they attended the shooter's funeral. And they comforted his widow. And they didn't stop there. They also offered financial support to his widow. And the world didn't understand. And can you hear Jesus say, how many times should we forgive? The context that this morning's gospel lesson comes in the scriptures, Jesus has been talking about the behavior of the church, the way we should live together in Christian community. He taught about the need to be humble, to look out for those members in our community that are more fragile. He talked about accountability, reconciliation and, re reconciliation and restoration, and about church discipline. Peter asked the Lord if another member of the church, talking about the community that Jesus had just been teaching about, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? Seven times? You see, Peter, who tends to take hard knocks from preachers and teachers, actually had been listening very closely to Jesus. He's trying to be a good student of Jesus' teachings and to really get things right. See, in his experience, he thought that some people within the Christian community would get things wrong, who would take advantage of others in their own community, and who were not repentant when they sinned against one another, and who did not seek forgiveness. So actually, if you think about it, when Peter says seven times, he thinks he's being generous. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle his accounts with his servants. And the instance of the first servant has that bill of 10,000 talents. Back in Jesus' day, that was the largest unit of money. And we're talking about roughly 15 years of manual labor that the 10,000 talents represents. And so the king says to him, pay up. And there's no way that he could pay up. And so he forgives. Forgives generously wipes that debt away. But then that slave turns around and approaches one who owes him. And echoing the words of the one he owes money to, the second slave says, be patient with me. For what he owed was roughly 100 days of labor, still far more than he could handle in repayment. He didn't say that the debt was canceled. As a matter of fact, he threw him into prison. The king's extraordinary generosity is a counterpoint to the lack of mercy the lack of forgiveness in that second servant. I wonder what was going on in the mind of that servant. Did he not connect the two events in his own life? What had he been feeling? You see, there should have been a change. There should have been a transformation. When one receives forgiveness, and yet it hadn't changed him at all. No 
profound gratitude for the mercy that he was granted. And so, the problem, the struggle that all Christians have, a kind of a person has gratitude for forgiveness, and what kind of person cannot then in turn show to others? That unconditional mercy of the king the servant's unwillingness to show mercy to another. It shows us something about the nature of forgiveness. It's to be unconditional. No strings attached. No limit. The forgiveness that we're asked to show has no formula. There is no cutoff between that which should not be forgiven in that which should be. Or to forgive, period. It's outrageous grace. <laughs> Remember, grace is love that's not earned or deserved. That's what forgiveness and mercy is. For Alan Nichols, he wrote, Forgiveness is not just some fortunate occurrence that has come our way, it, like winning the lottery, but rather it's anchored in the very being of the God of the Bible. It is so close to the heart of God that it is offered in the life of his son. And it demands a concrete response in the context of the imitation of the son's life. In other words, it should change us if we've been forgiven. We can't be the same person anymore. So we're supposed to deal with others the same way God has dealt with you and I. This forgiveness is a part of what it means to be the church. You can't take 